Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, April 13th. I am Joanne Kuntz, and I am here with my partner, Jackie Durham. We are talking to you today about title insurance. Um, Jackie is known for her very compelling topics. <laughs> and here we are with yet another zinger. So uh, we wanted to talk to you. Um, title insurance is something that comes up a lot in the course of real estate transactions, whether they're residential or commercial even including refinances. If you're refinancing a property that you own, uh, title insurance will be involved. It's one of those things, kind of like a survey, um, that is part of real estate and people just know that it is, but they don't necessarily know why or what it is or why it matters. Um, so we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the basics, um, what to expect, how much it is, and things that you can be proactive for um, on the lookout for if you are involved in a title insurance transaction. So without further ado, as always, these, are these webinars are recorded and distributed, and we are happy to field your calls, your questions, um, if you would use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So first, before we go any further, what is title insurance and what does it cover? Um, title insurance is actually protection from financial loss. In the event that a problem arises with respect to the rights of use or ownership of a property, what does that mean? That means um, if somebody says they have the right to use the property and you didn't realize that, or if someone thinks from a prior transaction that they were an owner and they weren't paid in a sale, something like that. And these, these things, of course, sound very unusual. And sometimes I hear people say, oh, I don't buy, you don't need title insurance. Um, you know, the problem is that all of our work with respect to handling a real estate transaction is based 100% on the public records. Um, public records or searches are a search of all the information that is available regarding that property. However, public record searches may not uncover all of the problems which could make a title defective. The primary reason they don't contain everything is human error. Um, people make mistakes, whether it's a mistake from the recording, from the person who actually proffered the document for recording, maybe a missing unit number or in the legal description or something like that, or sometimes the clerk indexes things incorrectly. They're scanning in thousands of documents um, at a time, and instead of writing unit 13, maybe they wrote 31. So when I search for unit 13, I don't find anything because it's sitting over on unit 31. Um, unfortunately, whenever human beings are involved, uh, human error can happen. So the title insurance will cover the cost, the legal costs of defending the claim or getting it fixed. Now, in the name, it's title insurance, but what on earth is a title? A title is um, evidence that someone owns the property, owns the right to use it, owns the right to uh, own the property. Um, now, what seems unusual is that someone other than the legal owner may have the right to use the property or have ownership of the property. Um, now, how does that happen? <laughs> in a myriad of ways, and uh, Jackie is famous for uh, having things happen in real life that are only supposed to happen on law school exams, so I'm certain we'll get to uh, some more of yeah. that. <laughs> and can I just say, Please. That I read somewhere, there's some, some statistic out there that, uh, I, I think it was from Old Republic, that I think one in every four title commitments that are issued, uh, some kind of title issue is discovered. So everybody yeah. likes to say these are few and far between, and I don't know how old that statistic is, so don't yeah. don't hold me to it. But it just goes to show you that they they do come up with some frequency, and it's not just um, you know glaring issues mm -hmm. where somebody forgot to record a deed or something like that. But it can be as simple as oh that corporation didn't properly authorize that sale because yeah. we didn't get the the written consent of all the shareholders, mm -hmm. or oh actually. We thought we had all the heirs sign off on this a couple transactions ago, but here's Bob, the stray heir, and he wants his interest in the property. So it's things like that that can sometimes come in later and after the fact. And a, and a simple review of the public record isn't always going to make those kinds of mm -hmm. defects apparent. Absolutely. And the other thing about those defects is not only are they expensive to defend, you might still have a loss of the property because if there was um, a, a prior transfer that was effective and you didn't know it, you know, it still, it's not still going to squash that other person's rights. So you can have um, some big dollar issues pretty quickly. And the other thing is that it can take years to discover 
that there's an issue because you move in and it's not until the neighbor sells his lot that maybe a problem is discovered or something like that. So because the, the defects can take so long to surface and they can sometimes surface because of another transaction with a different parcel in your neighborhood or subdivision, you know, it's not like, it, it's not predictable on, well, this house is 20 years old, so it's fine. All of the property in Florida is the same age. So once Florida <laughs> became a state, all of the land in Florida is at the same risk, uh, basically, for, for issues. So sometimes people will say things like, well, I have a brand new house, so I don't yeah. need title insurance. This is not a home warranty. Yes, you have a brand new house. That means you shouldn't have a problem with your roof. You shouldn't have a problem with your plumbing or your air conditioner. But the actual land that the house is sitting on is the same age as all of the other land. If anything, you may have more risk with a newer home because there have been more recently contractors and subcontractors who might have lien rights that might not have been properly extinguished. So um, on the flip side, people say, oh my gosh, my house is so old, there can't possibly be any issues. Um, but again, the it's, passed, it's passed through so many hands that right. something, some issue would have been, surely would have been caught. Exactly. And that's Please just, let me correct you. <laughs> that's just, it's just, they're all at the same exact risk, residential, commercial, they're all the same age. So the types of issues that we see between residential and commercial are different. Um, but in terms of the age of the, of the property and the opportunity for there to be some kind of issue that really is equal amongst all of the land in Florida. Um, some types of common issues that are covered under a title insurance policy, the more, you know, you hear things about fraud and someone signed a deed and they weren't supposed to, those things happen, I, you can't say no, but more commonly, it's an inaccurate or incomplete re legal description. Sometimes legal descriptions are what we call lot block legals, where it's lot five, block two of the such and such subdivision per the plat of the public records of Sarasota County. Uh, and it can be real easy, one sentence. Sometimes they are four pages long and they're filled with meets and bounds legal descriptions, which is, you know, fence northwest by 15 degrees, 48 minutes and two seconds, and then south, southeast, you know, and these things literally drone on for pages. Um, we are not fond of retyping those legals. We will take them from a prior deed and, and exhibit A them and reuse them in a new deed. Um, but oftentimes those still need to be verified. And uh, Jackie in her infamous law school um, daily practice of law <laughs> actually <laughs> had this where she read the whole four page legal description and found um, a couple of errors and it's a, it's a big problem. So um, it's the kind of thing that can easily be missed. Um, particularly if title is issued by a non-lawyer title company and they're not, you know, they're just saying, oh, it's a long legal, just attach it and not verify it, then these mistakes can go on um, for, for quite some time. Also mistakes in recording. We uniquely are situated at the border of Sarasota Manatee County. So frequently if a seller tells me they have a mortgage to pay off and I receive the title search back from Old Republic, our title insurance underwriter, and it doesn't show a mortgage payoff, I'll go back and say, hey, my seller says that, you know, they have a mortgage with SunTrust. And they'll go back and look at the other county and then find it. So, you know, the maybe property is in Sarasota, but it got recorded in Manatee or vice versa. Particularly as you're on that University Parkway corridor where the mailing address is Sarasota, but it's actually in Manatee County. Um, again, human beings do the job, it happens all the time. Um, we've seen also mistakes in recording uh, we had one in a condominium recently that the recording was placed on uh, unit 13, but it really was for unit 31. And um, so when I ran title, it looked like I needed a different seller because <laughs> they had things a little bit backwards. So um, this also covers liens from unpaid uh, taxes, whether it's income tax or inheritance, estate tax, gift tax. Um, also covers recorded easements where um, maybe the path that was described in the easement doesn't describe the, doesn't follow the route that's actually um, being used. And um, so those are, you know, kind of common things that we do see. It also covers identity theft and, you know, erroneous interpretations of wills and, you know, these kind of bigger fraud and duress, those things that they're certainly covered. They happen with a much, much, much less frequency. Really, the issue is really more human error. Uh, it all boils down to human error because you have to think you have 
you know, uh, you have human beings interpreting corporate documents. You have human beings interpreting wills. Um, so sometimes they might interpret them improperly. And if that, go, you know, that can go unnoticed, but it all really boils down to human error because we have so many human hands that are involved in these transactions and in these transfers each time it happens. And if you think about the number of times that a lot of these properties have been, have changed hands, yeah. um, the statistically you're going to find something. So it's, it's absolutely it's absolutely true. And, you know, there are also companies out there now like LifeLock that is um, trying to protect your credit. They have a thing called Title Lock where they're selling a service to prevent forged deeds. And, you know, that's kind of gives people a false sense of security because that would mean that the you know, notary is in on creating this, you know, fraud and, and notarizing for someone that wasn't the right person or they had a fake ID or this is a pretty elaborate scam. What really is your title insurance is really co enough coverage. You really don't need anything else. Um, and you just need to, to be mindful that you don't make any subsequent transfers to upend your title insurance. Now, title insurance is different than any other kind of insurance that you might have. So car insurance, medical insurance, those things all protect you against unforeseen future events. So if you get in a car accident after you buy the insurance, you're gonna be compensated. However, title insurance is designed to protect you um, against claims from the past. So from the day you become the owner forward, anything that would happen to the property, you would need to agree to. So title insurance isn't covering that because you've agreed to it. So this is really covering issues that should have been found in the public record, like liens or easements or setbacks that were not discovered. Um, and sometimes they're not discovered because they weren't recorded. So if I gave Jackie an easement uh, because she's my neighbor and said, yeah, you can cross the westerly five feet of my property so you can access the beach. And she takes that document and puts it in the drawer in her safety deposit box in her bank, but doesn't take it to the public record to record it. The public won't know, but that deed is still, that easement is still effective. It's still valid. I still gave it. Um, but if you bought Jackie's property and that easement continued, um, or you bought my property and Jackie's easement continued, you might be mad that Jackie's walking across your property and you can't stop that. Your title insurance would compensate you um, for, for that impaired use that someone else has used to the property that you didn't know. That's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. But I do, you know, I do think it's, it's, it's nice to look at it that way, how you compared it to the auto policy or a liability policy. This is a, a one-time premium that protects you for the life of your ownership of the property um, and for the life of some of your heirs, depending on the way your policy is written. Um, but something I do want to raise my hand about that comes up a lot, a lot of people are unaware of this, they kind of assume that if they transfer their interest in the property to say their wholly owned LLC or corporation, that that won't affect the policy. And that really can trigger a void in the coverage. So you wanna be careful about things like that when it comes to the policy continuing on. Um, a lot of people falsely assume that it will continue as long as the there's no actual change in beneficial ownership interest. Now that may be the case for some policies, but it's not the case for all policies. So you definitely wanna take a look at that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I just wanna mention is I feel like sometimes not as often now, but I feel like in the past, Joanne, we've gotten a lot of pushback from certain buyers about getting title insurance at all. Um, and I think, you know, some of these may be from, you know, coming from out of the U.S. where title insurance doesn't exist. And they say, hey, I'll just pursue the seller if I need to. If there's any kind of issue, I, can, I have recourse against the seller. The problem with that is, um, number one, the, the title insurance company which is a multi-billion dollar company, is going to have much bigger pockets to pull from mm -hmm. in the event there is a true title issue. Whereas you know, pursuing a seller who may or may not still be alive by the time you discover the defect, who may or may not be in the United States by the time you discover mm -hmm. the defect, or who may or may not be solvent. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the thousands, tens of thousands, if not more of real estate litigation and how protracted that process can be it really makes more common sense to have a, a nice clean title insurance policy that you pay for one time that will cover that kind of litigation should it become necessary. So um, is it required? Do you, no. Do you have to have it? No, but it really makes no sense not to. Um, Especially you know. when you look at the cost 
of the title policy vis-a-vis -vis the purchase price. If you're paying cash, you're not required to have it, but if you're investing that much cash, leaving it um, unprotected seems odd. Um, you know, if you right. had a loan, the mortgage company would require you to have a lender's policy. So they're not gonna put their money up without the protection. Um, and so it strikes me as odd that sometimes people will. Um, and and also it's not the savings to not take it that they think because you know the title agents are compensated by the insurance company so if you are looking to hire a lawyer to do a closing without title insurance you're now back to paying attorney's fees rather than the title title insurance premium non-lawyer title companies can they're not licensed to do a closing without issuing title insurance so it can also be difficult to find uh, someone willing to do to meet that request for you. So that's something that I hear a lot where people are like, oh, I'll just take that off. Like it's not just the line item to delete. You're going to substitute it with attorney's fees and that sometimes gets worse. So right. and <laughs> we still about have to do all the same work. Yeah. We still have to run a title search and a municipal lien search and we still have to do all the background to make sure that when you hand the $300,000 to the, to the seller that you're getting what you expected. The only thing you're saving is the insurance in case there is an issue. But that work that needs to be done to get you there still needs to be done by a lawyer. And so now you're paying attorney's fees. So sometimes, um, depending on the scope and complexity of the title search, we find that the attorney's fees come out higher than the title insurance premium. That premium is set by the state based on the purchase price. So it's not something that you can shop around for, especially when we have insurance agent clients. They're like, I'm going to shop around for the title insurance. And I'm like, no, good luck. <laughs> You know, because you can do that in any other type of insurance. So this is not something that you bring your own insurance policy into the game. The closing agent is issuing it. Um, and it is unfamiliar to people. So um, it's not unusual that we find that folks don't understand it and, and have questions about the process. Now, right. there's also two different types of insurance that are issued. You have an owner's policy and a lender policy. So if you are borrowing a mortgage, you've got to get a lender's policy. You don't have a choice. Um, for the lender, at which point uh, bolting on the owner's policy is really, really inexpensive um, because it's all a flat fee, as I said, set by the state. If you are paying cash, then you just have an owner's policy um, and that owner's policy also set by the state um, covers you um, as the owner of the property. It's important though, if you are purchasing a property you intend to heavily renovate, um, or if you're buying maybe something that was already in foreclosure and you're buying an REO from a bank, uh, there may be title errors there that were not resolved in the foreclosure. Um, and oftentimes you're not able to get title insurance. Um, if, you're, if you're buying those properties and you may need to be prepared for um, a quiet title action or something like that in the future, you need to just make sure that if you are getting involved in something like that, you understand that, appreciate that and are receiving an adequate enough discount on the property to, to pay for those things. Because that's sometimes people think, oh, I'm gonna buy a tax deed and I'm gonna buy this. And then they don't really understand that um, what you're signing up for in terms of uh, legal issues, time and cost. Uh, you know, if you think you're flipping that, you're probably not. <laughs> well, and can I just share a thought on that? I've seen this and, and, and this kind of goes to the point of not all title agents are created equal. Um, and you, you need to be careful who you're purchasing your title policy through. So I've personally seen in a couple of occasions where a title, in, um, a title company will issue a title commitment and one of the exceptions includes one of those foreclosure actions, one of the prior foreclosure actions, because they don't trust that it was necessarily done properly. And if it wasn't, now we have a title issue. But what they do is they accept that from the title coverage, which sort of, in, a, in effect, guts the coverage that's being provided. Yeah. So it's really important if you are a buyer, um, if you're going through a title company and you're not closing with your actual attorney, that you you at least have your attorney review that that title commitment so you know what you're what you're bargaining for, um, because there's a difference between insurable title and marketable title. Mm -hmm. And if you're just bargaining for insurable title, yeah, you might get a title policy. But if you have a bunch of crap at the back of the policy that's accepting from coverage, yeah. now it's not worth the paperclip that's binding it together. Whereas marketable title, um, you know, that's that's going to be title that is healthy enough to ensure that you can sell the property in the future to a third party purchaser. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's another consideration to make. And, and something else I would say is there is a there's exception to uh, title insurance coverage in the event that 
you have purchased the property for less than fair market value. So mm -hmm. if you have, if you're purchasing via some sweetheart deal with your boyfriend or your uncle or whoever, um, if you're not paying the whole fair market value, uh, the reason why there's an acceptance for coverage as it relates to an issue that maybe arises under those circumstances is because the, the rights of creditors of the seller are going to be a little more broad and coming after after that asset, even though it was technically sold to you, um, because the creditor protection only really extends to third party purchasers, bona fide third party purchasers for value. So just keep that in mind too. Whenever you're you're taking a sweetheart deal, you're you're going to have somewhat less coverage because of that exception. Absolutely, and a lot of people don't don't realize that. It is it's so true. And keep in mind that if you do file a claim in addition to the financial loss that you've experienced, the um, title insurance company is also paying the full cost of any legal defense of the title. So you need to be mindful um, of, of that as well. Cause sometimes people go, oh, well, you know, I'm only spending 200,000 on the property or this. Okay, well, if you're only spending, if, if 200,000 and only come out in the same sentence, and that, that's the level of assets that you have, then it's only a few bucks more for your for your protection. And you know, I had a I had a client who bought a bought a property. It was in foreclosure, but it was not the process was not complete. So his closing was still he was still buying from the actual seller, the borrower that was in foreclosure, not from the bank. Um, they were at a non-lawyer title company and uh, they closed. There was a Liz Pendens for the foreclosure action out there, but the title company failed to get that Liz Pendens discharged or dismissed from the judge. So that hadn't been closed out. So what happened was our client purchased the property on Thursday and the following Tuesday, the foreclosure sale still happened because the court didn't know that the closing had happened and that the bank had been paid in full as a result of the closing. So the foreclosure sale still happened. Whoever bought at the foreclosure sale thinks they're the owner. My guy thinks he's the owner and both of them are right, <laughs> right? Yeah. In, in terms of what the public record said. So how did it get resolved? Well, my guy called me in a panic and was like, am I out $300,000? Like I said, did you buy title insurance? Yes. I said, then you're not out. Either you're going to get the house back or you're going to get the money back. But if you didn't have title insurance, there's a real opportunity that you're out either the house or the money to fight to get the house. Now, title insurance deployed lawyers and uh, 30 days later had the foreclosure suit, the foreclosure sale unwound um, and said, hey, it wasn't fair. Wells Fargo had already been paid five days earlier or whatever the number of days was. So this was not fair. And it was, you know, one of the financial companies that had bought the property at foreclosure sale. So, you know, the court will also look at the equity of, you know, this is one guy versus a huge um, financial company that, you know, buys these things for a living. So uh, my guy got the property back, but never ever, he's like, I will never do anything without calling you again. Because, you know, if we had that closing in here, we would not have gone to closing without having met the, the title requirements and having that, we would have to just delay the closing until we had proof from the court that that foreclosure sale had been canceled. So there's a million, I could keep you on this webinar for 12 hours of all the different ways that this can happen because everyone fully believes it will not happen to them. Um, and it's funny because, you know, we see such a broad cross section of different types of properties throughout the state, particularly in Sarasota and Manatee County, but we do closings throughout the state. And over the 15 years I've done this, I've seen so many things and then you call underwriting with a weird problem or a question and you realize that's all they do is feel those lawyers at the older at the underwriter um they're all they hear are the law school stories that we're calling with like this is well, a they, crazy they problem. hate they hate when i call them they do it and, and that's bad because their real job is to field these calls and now they're <laughs> like oh my gosh how did you find this rubik's cube but um, but that it's busy enough that they have a whole department of people answering these questions. So while we don't have these questions daily, um, you know, somebody is because they're busy. So it's, mm -hmm. it's no different than my, um, famous references to Morgan and Morgan. Like somebody must be having these problems because they are really busy. <laughs> 
So keep that in mind. Um, if your lender is getting a title insurance policy, it does not cover you. So sometimes people go, oh, it'll be fine because the lender's got title insurance. That just means they're getting paid. Doesn't cover anything for you. And make sure, yeah, their mortgage gets paid, but it does not protect your property interest. Exactly. And you know that, like you said, Joanne, before the the cost, like let's say I'm an owner and I'm gonna go buy this property and I elect not to purchase a title policy, I'm still paying the same amount, less maybe a hundred dollars mm -hmm. for the title uh, for my lender's policy. Yeah. So why not pay the extra hundred dollars and just get your your own? And it's it's so worth the the investment. It, um, I can't say it enough. There yeah. is, you know, and then oftentimes to that vein, to the same vein, people will say, well, I'm, I'm paying cash, so I don't want a survey. You might save $300 by not getting a survey, but the oh, survey man. coverage on the title insurance policy is crucial. And if you don't have coverage for that, you don't have coverage. In fact, you cannot, the lenders will tell people, which is the most annoying thing that they do, oh, you don't need a survey. But part of their requirements to me as the closing agent, as the title agent, is that I have to issue them the lender's insurance policy with an endorsement called Form 9. I can't issue a Form 9 without a survey. So they tell you, you don't, you don't have to have a survey. Lots of times they don't even look at the survey. They don't even require us to upload it to them. We do it out of an abundance of caution, but many lenders don't require it. So you're telling me I don't have to have a survey, but you're telling me I have to give you a piece of insurance policy that I can only get with a survey. So stop saying that, lenders. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you know, I like that you mentioned Form 9 because there's also a Form 9.2 that owners should always get, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it's really necessary to round out your coverage under the title policy because, again, going back to the exceptions to coverage in Schedule B2, there's always going to be an exception for the matters of plat, um, matters specific to your particular subdivision, and any kind of deed restrictions. The problem with this is you, let's say, hopefully you got a survey. The surveyor is still human. So you typically would require or request at least that they depict all the lines of the setbacks and the easements on your property. So you can make sure that your pool isn't sitting in a setback or an easement and you know, whatever else you may have constructed on the, on the property. Um, it's, it's prudent to do that. But even if you are careful and you request that of your surveyor, they may miss something. They, they may not depict all of the easement lines or all the setback lines. So this Form 9.2 endorsement gives you that additional coverage that if you do have a violation of a setback, or if you are encroaching into your neighbor's lot or they're encroaching into your lot and there's some kind of removal that becomes necessary uh, and some kind of expense uh, surrounding those restrictions, um, you'll be covered from that. Otherwise, you're not necessarily gonna be covered from those, those kinds of issues and expenses because it's accepted from your coverage and that's going to be in any kind of policy now you will have to get a survey in order to get a, a 9.2 endorsement but you need to get a survey anyways so um that's yeah you know, we, we really try hard not to let people out of here without a survey and oftentimes yeah. your seller may have a survey and just be able to sign a, an affidavit that says there have been no changes to the property uh boundary since that survey was drawn no room addition no pool addition and it doesn't even cost anything so this is you know, we're running that down in the background, whether you realize it or not. That's the, one of the first things that we do is, is interface with the realtors and say, hey, sellers, you know, listing agent, do you have a copy of this survey? Does the seller have this to share? And I know the seller has one if they have a mortgage that I have to pay off. Um, whether <laughs> some people can find it or not is a different story. Oftentimes in refinances, I'll ask folks, I need a copy of your survey and they'll go, oh, I can't find it. Um, and then I say, well, then we have to order a new one and it's going to be three, 400 bucks, and then they find it because they actually looked for it. <laughs> <laughs> this so is it's amazing what happens like when you go look for it. It's, you know, same thing with my, with my daughter, when she goes into the toilet, room, like, I can't find it. I'm like, well, it's right there. I didn't even have to lift anything to find it. So <laughs> she gets those looking nice from her dad. <laughs> <laughs> so um, part of the process of how we you know, go about the process of issuing the title insurance is we do a title search. That's the first thing that we do, whether it's a refinance or a purchase, which is the really, a, a, it's a report that we order that from the title company that show, title insurance company that shows the chain of title. It shows us the taxes and judgments and mortgages and who the owners were, if there were easements. It really is what clarifies for me 
um, who is selling the property and that the buyer is going to get all of the rights to the property that they are expecting. Um, you're also going to see a component called a municipal lien search. Now, I always tell people in the closing statement when we're going through these things, like I'm from New York, I appreciate a good scam when I see one. Um, the names are very similar between title search and municipal lien search, and the prices are almost the same. This is not a duplicative search with just two fees. If I had thought of that, <laughs> I wouldn't have to work here. But uh, municipal lien searches are actually searches of liens that attach automatically to the property without a separate recording. So the county, for example, doesn't need to record a document with itself to attach a lien for unpaid utility bills or um, code enforcement violations or things like that. Um, so um, we do have a question here before I move off of surveys that says, if the seller is selling and selecting and paying the title and there is not an updated survey, is it up to a cash buyer to pay for the survey if they want one? Absolutely. And you do have to be cautious if you are the buyer or a realtor representing the buyer. Um, if it's cash and some title companies will not push like, oh, no survey, no one asked for one and they'll just move on and not um, you know, press the buyer to, to get one or even sometimes offer like, hey, did you want one? They just keep moving if they, if they don't, if their a request isn't made for one. In the contract, it says buyer will um, order a survey if they want one. And practically speaking, we take care of that ordering because there's certain certifications and inf information that the surveyor needs that we have. So we do that you know, as a courtesy, you don't want to be in here making the sausage. So we, we have a tendency to get the quote for you as the buyer and order uh, the search or order the survey. They also want the title search uh, information when they, when they perform the survey. So if we give that to the surveyor, he can do a better job and have information at his fingertips. So we like to make sure that we've done that. Another thing to be cognizant of when it comes to the searches is that you can order under the municipal lien search, searches with respect to code enforcement violations, open and expired permits, building violations. Mm -hmm. Those things are not something that are coming standard. They typically do not cost more, um, but when the municipal lien search is ordered from a search provider, a company that does these searches for the closing agents, um, they ask us like, what do you want? If I have the seller, I'm not gonna order an open and expired permit search unless I'm directed by the buyer. If I have the buyer, I'm ordering it whether they ask for it or not because I want as much information for the client that I re represent. If I have the seller, it's up to the buyer to tell me that they want that. So, and that's not, you know, anything that's not um, kosher or, or, you know, shady. It's I'm representing my client. So if you aren't, if you are not the person who's hired the closing agent, you do need, whether you're the realtor or the buyer or the seller, um, you need to be making sure that you are, getting the appropriate searches so that you don't perceive to have uh, information that you didn't actually obtain. Yes. Now with the survey, that survey we've talked about, like that you need one, but what is it? So the survey is looking for um, the boundary line of the property, the placement of the physical house on the property, and in relation to existing setbacks or easements that are already outlined that affect the property. We're also looking for encroachments or violations into platted setback lines versus association setback lines. And whether there is an encroachment, some are, some are very common and minor and some are major. So common encroachments into easements are things like air conditioner, concrete pads, pool equipment pads, fences, driveways, you know, oftentimes before a neighborhood is even built, the county will require a, um, an easement, a drainage and utility easement that surrounds the property, maybe five or 10 feet along the perimeter of the property. Doesn't mean anything is buried there. Surveyor can only draw what he sees sitting on top of the land. He can't tell you if something is buried there or not. But if it is, and if the county needs to access uh, the property to maintain or repair the line, you have to give them access. And if they damage anything that's in that easement, it's at your cost to repair it. So if you've got brick paver driveway and you know they're coming, you might wanna have someone pull up the brick pavers, you'll do a nicer job than the, than the county will. And those can be replaced. But if they do damage, um, then title insurance isn't covering that and the county certainly is not covering that. <laughs> right. Um, exactly. Major encroachments would be things like if the pool 
or the house is in a setback or an easement. That's a massive deal. So a little air conditioner concrete pad, they can usually work around. And if they had to dig it up, it's hardly very deep into the, into the ground and it's not very large. So it's really inexpensive and easy to get around. If part of your living room is in the easement, that is not easy or inexpensive to get around. And that, you know, that is a big problem. And we have and had closings come to a screeching that. halt. Yeah, and it and it's and I we literally had I if you recall that deal, Joanne, where we had to get, I think it was around sixty signatures to mm -hmm. get a variance to accept this encroachment into a setback mm -hmm. um, that was unnoticed in the two prior transactions. Yep. So because our buyer got a got a survey and we got ahead of the issue, did it delay closing a little bit? Yes, it did. But you know, our our buyer was pretty happy because it's not going to be their issue when they go to sell. Exactly. And, and these things don't go away. And sometimes people get mad at us and like, wow, you know, the guy before didn't make a scene and it's like, well, I'm sorry, someone else did a bad job. I and mean, this is very unpopular news. When we first receive the report and we recognize that there's an issue, the first thing we do is scram to double check everything. Like maybe there's a mistake because I don't want to fire off an alarm bell and freak everybody out if there's, Again, human beings have done the job. So if the title searcher that provides the report to us didn't see a variance as recorded, um, you know, okay, great, this is not a big problem. Or there's an exception in the declaration, um, you know, for the association that allows this if it's an association setback. So oftentimes there, there is a way to resolve this without getting everybody completely freaked out. And sometimes it's a really big problem. By the time we come and say this is a really big problem, we have exhausted all other remedies to know that this is not a really big problem. And, you know, in 15 years, I can count on one or one and a half hands the number of times it's happened. This doesn't happen frequently, but when it happens, it's a massive issue. So um, it's kind of like, just like your house doesn't burn down frequently. Yeah. But, but when, when it does, does, it's a big deal. <laughs> Perfect. So glad we invited you to the party. <laughs> Now, we alluded to earlier the fact that the title insurance rates are set by the state. Um, so Florida State statute outlines exactly how much this costs. It's a one-time premium based on the purchase price of the property. And that coverage um, is in place, essentially, in, in most cases, for as long as you own the property. What we have to be cautious of are potential disruptions of coverage. So people call us all the time. Hey, I need a quick claim deed. I need to take mom off. I need to put mom on. I need to put my sister on. I need to add my daughter. And people are doing that for a variety of reasons. I always put my hands up and stop everybody to learn more about why. Some places will just take your money and spit out a quick clean deed and do exactly what you asked. To me, that's the equivalent of calling the doctor and saying, I need Prilosec. Mm, maybe you need to quit eating chicken wings at midnight. Like <laughs> there may be an alternate solution to your heart. I feel like you're directing that comment at me. <laughs> No, you, you're just fine eating your chicken wings at midnight. But, you know, sometimes if, if the people call and they say, hey, this is what I need. And I'm like, well, why are you taking mom off of the title? Oh, well, because she's going in a nursing home and she can't have any assets. Right. When is she going? Next Friday? Like, <laughs> this is not the time to be making a transfer like that. On the flip side, people will say, put me on because mom's getting older and I want to be able to just take care of things for her. We might be disrupting title insurance. We might be disrupting homestead. We might have gift tax issues. We might have doc stamps issues. This is a bigger, quick claim deeds are a whole nother webinar um, with a different batch of jokes. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but certainly my point is that you've got to have, um, uh, you've got to have some understanding of why you're making that transfer um, so that we can best direct you so that we don't disrupt the title insurance coverage. You've paid for this coverage and you don't want a quick claim deed uh, upending it. And then sometimes people say, oh, I didn't know that was a problem. I'll just deed it right back. And well, you've now doubled the problem and not eliminated it. So we do have to be, um, to be cautious about adding or removing owners or um, transferring to LLCs or trusts after closing. Um, not, I'm not saying those things are not possible. I'm saying they need to be done thoughtfully and with information. This is not the time to um, jump on legal Zoom or Google and grab a deed and fire it off. That's, that seldom works well. Right. 
that's a whole yeah, other. And, and you know that that it, whenever you're ready we do have some endorsements that we need to cover because that's but, kind of in the same vein so yeah. there's a uh, there's a change in partners endorsement and it doesn't just apply to partnerships it applies to llc's and corporations really any kind of legal entity um and it's coverage for if you do change ownership interests if i sell you know half of my interest to joanne um, in the property, in the LLC that holds the property, it's not going to automatically void coverage um, because certain certain title policies allow you to to change ownership interests up to a certain extent, but some title policies do not allow that. So if I transfer five percent of my ownership percentage in the LLC, now my entire title policy can be voided. So that's one endorsement that I would would recommend in addition to you know just carefully reviewing your title policy with your with your attorney um, you know don't think that if you get that endorsement you can just go do whatever you want you still need to consult with your attorney to make sure <laughs> to make sure that you're um, even within the parameters of that endorsed additional coverage um, another a couple other things I wanted to touch on um, in terms of endorsements we already covered the 9.2 coverage which extends to violations of easements um, and uh, setbacks and other restrictions, deed restrictions or neighborhood restrictions, things like that. That's really important um, and I think necessary to truly round out your coverage. Um, also, uh, the same as survey endorse endorsement. We were talking before about how the surveyor goes out and verifies the, the delineation of your property and the improvements on your property, but what has happened in the past because surveyors are human and they get busy and um, they may come into a subdivision where some of the houses maybe look similar um, and they actually end up sketching and drawing the wrong house. They maybe sketch the neighboring house. So the same as survey endorsement ensures that the property that is drawn on the survey actually matches the legal description and the title policy. Now they're not warranting and endorsing coverage if the surveyor made a mistake and maybe didn't depicts a setback line or an easement or something like that but they're at least saying that this is the house that you're you're insuring um, and this is the proper drawing um, another one i wanted to mention is if you're if you're going in and say buying two adjacent or three adjacent lots and you're going to be building or you're going to be demoing and rebuilding something um, there is a an endorsement that will ensure that there is no gap or gores in between the two or three adjacent lots. Um, and that that also sounds a bit out there, like it doesn't happen, but you would be surprised how many big tracts of land have little islands where, because they were once separate parcels and became one, one whole larger parcel, there might be a stray owner that owns a little sliver of land right there in the middle. Um, and that can happen because of what Joanne was describing, where there might be a defect in the legal description of certain properties. So that coverage I think is, is very important and especially if you're going to be buying more than one parcel that are going to be combined um, and lastly because we have a lot of folks who are buying properties on uh, bodies of water or um, canals things like that there's the navigational servitude endorsement that will cover you in the event that the uh, government claims some kind of some portion of your property that was once forming a part of the navigational waters so if the end of your property line was once underwater, there's an exception to your title coverage that basically says if that's retaken by the government, which they have the right to do, uh, if that's retaken by the government, then you, you don't have any coverage for that under your title policy. The navigational servitude fills in that hole and basically removes that exception so that if you have a dock that's built at the end of your property, and for whatever reason, the government takes that portion of land and you, you, you lose your dock, um, that expense can be reimbursed to you under under that endorsement coverage. None of just these things are my happened. favorites. <laughs> this is just the top ten. <laughs> You're yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, we did have a question that said, um, "What if a portion of an outbuilding is built or sitting within county building setbacks? Typically, outbuildings and sheds are not an issue." Um, because they don't have a deep footer. So it's something that is still movable. Maybe it has a few inches footer, but we're not talking about feet deep like a house. So, you know, keep in mind too, surveys are not recorded or sent anywhere. So if you have a survey done with respect to your purchase, your neighbor's not going to know what those 
what the results of the survey were. And it's not like, oh, the county is now aware that you're sitting in that. They're not going to even care unless they needed to use um, the, the portion of the land that was in the setback for a reason. So if there is a drainage and utility easement, they're not just sweeping the properties to make sure nothing is in those easements. They're not coming. You could go 50 years and if nothing's buried there, no one's gonna care. Um, it's only if there's something buried there and if they need to access that parcel. So you don't want to put something permanent there. And you certainly don't want to put something there on purpose. But if it is there, the risk of that causing an issue um, can be low because moving something without a huge footer may, be cost, it may have some cost, but we're not talking about hacking off part of a living room, um, which right. I, you know, which is possible. People do build into setbacks and especially in new construction. I, ha I saw a case when... I was at my old firm. I didn't do land use, but um, a colleague of mine did. And it, there was a big political issue um, with a house on the water. And there was a person who owned it that wasn't hugely popular. And it was, yep, you know, got to take two feet off the whole side of the house that's in the setback. And it was unpopular and wasteful, but um, a point was made for sure. So um, not everyone is so interesting politically. Um, <laughs> To be involved. Yeah, that, that guy uh, should have gotten a 9.2 endorsement. That guy should have had a better architect, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there were a, a menagerie of, of problems that were a comedy of errors there, but I'm just suggesting it. The worst case scenario is you can be told it has to, to be moved, but um, it's like I said, without buildings and sheds and things like that, they're not terribly costly um, like it would be to move part of a house. So right. I want to do... Um, to uh, just bring this information to you because especially if you're a realtor, a lot of times people just expect that you know about title insurance. And sometimes when I get close to realtors, um, they'll share with me and say like, I don't really know what that does. And I feel like I'm supposed to know because I've been in the business for 10 years. I don't know how you would know when you've not been on this side of the business. I just had exactly. a situation with a closing last month where I was given a piece of information um, by the buyer and I was like, mm, that's not been my experience that the lender would ask the seller to sign this first. And he was like, well, I am the lender and we do this and da, da, and that's fine. Turns out it does, but it doesn't goes through the realtors. doesn't ever go through my hands. Um, so there it's, you know, there should be no, no shame in that. Like, how would I know? They deal with the realtors on that. They don't deal with me as the closing agent to get this loan document piece signed at the very beginning of the transaction. Oftentimes I haven't even had contact with the seller at that point. So I'm certainly not the guy asking in this one particularly happened to be for sale by owner. So there were no realtors. So it came through my hands and I was like, Oh, I don't think we do that until closing. And I was wrong. I just had not been my experience. So um, once again, human being strikes again, like until Alexa, and 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 we learn Alexa, as we go as well. Alexa, do my closing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Alexa, right. Do my survey. <laughs> until we get to artificial intelligence for everything. Um, somebody might make a mistake. So um, or not have all the information. So title insurance is super important. And if you are a realtor and you would like a little bit more insider scoop, we're happy to give it to you. Um, happy to, sh to, um, to show people what a title search looks like. I will say, you know, the term title gets thrown around a closing frequently with several meanings in different contexts. So title could be how the seller is in title, how they own it how the buyer intends to vest into title as husband and wife, as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, whatever, tenants in common. Title can mean the title search. Title can mean the title commitment. Title can mean the title policy that's issued afterwards. So if you are confused, um, just ask because this is like, this is definitely like algebra. It will not get clearer if you just stay lost and hope to catch up in the middle. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't get better. So we're happy to help. We're happy to serve as a resource. Um, if you have questions, always, always feel free to let us know. Also, if you have other topics that you'd like to hear about, um, we gladly, gladly um, take your feedback on things that you think would be of interest. So I uh, would love to, um, love to get that with you. Um, if you have things that we can bring to you, we'd love to do that. So thank you, Jackie, as always, for uh, sharing with us all of your uh, helpful Rubik's cubes that you see on the on the regular basis because <laughs> like easy stuff and she gets the tough stuff. So if you are calling, um, call me, not her. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, 
we have um, we have a good team. So it's it's we have a lot of fun, and we try to um, solve all of these Rubik's cubes before they go out the door. So if you do have anything uh, topics wise, do let us know. Again, these are recorded. You'll find them on our Coons Associates uh, website, our Coons Parkin website, our YouTube channel, our Facebook pages. So if you can't sleep tonight and you need title insurance round two, you can replay this recording. Thank you so much. We will see you next Tuesday.